the highest tribute, Thurgood Marshall's Life, Leadership, and Legacy, written by Kekla Magoon, illustrated by Laura Freeman. The Highest Tribute, Thurgood Marshall's Life, Leadership, and Legacy, written by Kekla Magoon, illustrated by Laura Freeman. In recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. Thurgood Marshall Thorogood Marshall was in second grade when he decided that if there was something he didn't like about the world, he should try to change it. He started with his own name. Thurgood, he decided. From now on, I will be known as Thurgood Marshall. There were many more things Thurgood wanted to change about his world. He grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, a segregated city. The law required black people and white people to use separate public facilities such as restrooms and water fountains. Many stores and restaurants had whites-only signs. Theaters had separate seating areas, too. Thurgood observed big differences between the spaces for black people and white people. They were separate, but they were not equal. It was wrong. But it was the law, and one little black boy couldn't change it. Could he? Around the dinner table, Thurgood's father led discussions about important issues like segregation. His parents were determined to see their children break the boundaries the country's laws had set for them. If Thurgood was going to change anything, he had a lot of work ahead of him. But sometimes it was hard for him to believe it was worth trying. Thurgood's parents expected him to do well in school, but goofing around was much more fun. Sometimes he got in big trouble for misbehaving in class. One teacher assigned him to read the Constitution of the United States as punishment. The plan backfired. Thurgood loved reading about the law. The nation's constitution says all people are created equal. So how can segregation laws treat people differently? Thurgood wondered. Thurgood joined the high school debate team. It was a good place to ask his questions and discuss his solutions. He liked discovering facts that he could use to win an argument. He liked being part of a team. He liked using words and ideas to persuade people to see complicated issues in a new way. Segregation meant Thurgood had to attend a black college, so he went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. First things first, he joined the debate team. Later, he met Vivian Buster Burry, who would soon become his wife. Buster encouraged Thurgood's dreams. Thurgood would become the first to do a lot of things that a black person had never done before. In the past, debate teams from black colleges only debated other black teams. Thurgood's team knew this was wrong. Could they change it? They could! In 1928, the Lincoln University debate team faced Pennsylvania State College in the first interracial debate between U.S. colleges. Thurgood wanted to become a lawyer, but his preferred school, the University of Maryland, did not admit black students. This was wrong. But it was the law, and he couldn't change it. Yet. Thurgood went to Howard University Law School in Washington, D.C., another black college. Professor Charles Hamilton Houston shared Thurgood's belief that determined, educated people could do what was necessary to change unfair laws. Once again, Thurgood became part of a team using words and ideas to affect the world. Thurgood studied harder than ever and graduated first in his class. As a young lawyer in Baltimore, he represented Donald Murray, a black man who wanted to attend the University of Maryland. The school's whites-only admission policy was wrong, and it was time to try to change it. Thurgood won the case, resulting in the nation's first court order to desegregate a school. This accomplishment was one step in a long-term plan to urge the courts to outlaw segregation everywhere. 
Thurgood gained a reputation for being an excellent attorney. He took on civil rights cases all across the country. He worked alongside Professor Houston, who became a special counsel to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in New York. When Professor Houston retired, Thurgood took over his role as lead attorney in the team of activists. Thurgood's most famous case was the pinnacle of his fight against school segregation. Black families in Topeka, Kansas wanted the Board of Education to allow their black children to attend an all-white school. The local court in Kansas said this was illegal. Thurgood appealed the decision to the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in the country. He presented his evidence, and in 1954, the court decided school segregation was unconstitutional. Thurgood had won the case. This victory rocked the nation. The nine Supreme Court justices made decisions that affected the law throughout the country. The case may have started in Kansas, but the decision would apply to school children in every U.S. state. Thurgood argued and won seven important cases before the Supreme Court. Each case was one piece of his plan to make the United States a fair and equal place for all people. His colleagues nicknamed him Mr. Civil Rights. Thurgood's wife, Buster, grew ill and died of cancer in 1955. He mourned the loss of his beloved partner, who had always nurtured and encouraged him. He later married Cecilia Sissi Suyet, a Filipino woman 20 years younger than he was. No one minded the age difference, but interracial marriage was controversial at the time. Thurgood didn't care what people thought. He loved Sissy. They had two children together, Thurgood Jr. and John. His family was another team Thurgood enjoyed being part of. Sissy worked alongside him at the NAACP, and his sons would grow up to take jobs in public service working for justice in their own ways. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy asked Thurgood to become a judge. Instead of arguing cases himself, other lawyers would argue cases in front of him and he would get to decide. Thurgood accepted the job. He listened to over 100 court cases. None of his decisions was ever overturned by a higher court. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson promoted Thurgood to serve as a Solicitor General. He would argue cases in the Supreme Court again, this time on behalf of the U.S. government. He was the first black person to hold such a high position. Thurgood won 14 more Supreme Court cases. He had argued and won more Supreme Court cases than any other attorney. Sissy and Thurgood celebrated good news on June 12, 1967, when the Supreme Court struck down the ban on interracial marriage. The wave of change was growing stronger. The very next day, President Johnson nominated Thurgood Marshall for a seat on the Supreme Court. Many people did not like the idea of a black Supreme Court justice. Thurgood had to appear before Congress for hearings. They asked him hard questions about the law to try and trick him, but after years of being a lawyer, Thurgood was used to facing pressure from powerful people. He stayed calm, and when he was finished speaking, Congress could not deny that he was qualified. Thurgood Marshall was sworn in to the United States Supreme Court on October 2, 1967. He was no longer a young black boy from Baltimore, limited by unjust laws. Now he was one of the people who made sure the laws were fair. As the first black member of the Supreme Court, Justice Marshall stood up for civil rights in the same way he did as an attorney. Among the nine justices, decisions were made not by one person, but by the group. All those years on his school debate teams, and as part of a team of civil rights attorneys helped prepare Thurgood 
for the challenge of the Supreme Court deliberations. Thurgood's ideas could not win every argument, but he was good at making his opinion heard. If he knew a law was wrong, he was in a stronger position than ever to help change it. Finally, something went right. Thurgood's presence on the court helped change his country's laws forever. Upon his retirement, Thurgood left all his private writings, notes, and journals to the Library of Congress for immediate public use, breaking the tradition of Supreme Court papers staying sealed for 50 years. If his ideas could continue to help create equality, he wanted them to be seen by scholars, law students, or anyone with a desire to peek behind the scenes of history. When he died at age 84, Thurgood Marshall was laid in state in the Supreme Court Rotunda, an honor given only to one other justice before him. The whole country knew and still knows, through his lifetime of service to humanity, Thurgood Marshall earned himself the highest tribute. Thurgood Marshall Timeline July 2, 1908, Thurgood Marshall is born Baltimore, Maryland. June 24, 1925, Thurgood graduates from Frederick Douglass High School. September 1925, he starts college at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. September 4, 1929, he marries Vivian Buster Burry. June 1930, Thurgood graduates cum laude from Lincoln University. Fall 1930, he starts law school at Howard University. June 1933, he graduates magna cum laude from Howard University Law School. October 11, 1933, upon passing the bar exam, Thurgood signs the Maryland Test Book and officially becomes attorney at law. November 1933, he begins a private law practice in Baltimore. January 1934, he begins work with the NAACP in Baltimore, taking cases on referral. June 21, 1935, a Maryland judge rules in Murray v. Pearson desegregating the University of Maryland Law School. December 1935, he becomes the lead attorney for the Baltimore NAACP. October 1936, Thurgood and Buster move to New York City, where he works as an assistant special counsel to Charles Hamilton Houston of the NAACP, eventually succeeding him as a special counsel. February 12, 1940, <clears throat> he wins his first case in the U.S. Supreme Court, Chambers v. Florida. December 9, 1952, Thurgood argues Brown v. Board of Education in front of the Supreme Court. December 8, 1953, he re-argues Brown v. Board of Education in the Supreme Court. May 7, 1954, the Supreme Court rules on Brown v. the Board of Education, declaring segregation unconstitutional. February 1955, Thurgood's wife Vivian Buster Burry dies from cancer. December 1955, Thurgood and Cecilia Soyet marry. August 12, 1956, their son Thurgood Marshall Jr. is born. July 6, 1958, their son John Marshall is born. No October 5, 1961, nominated by President Kennedy, Thurgood becomes a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. August 23, 1965, appointed by Pre President Johnson, Thurgood becomes U.S. Solicitor General. June 13, 1967, President Johnson nominates Thurgood for Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. July 15 to the 24th, 1967, Thurgood participates in Congressional Confirmation Hearings. September 1, 1967, Thurgood becomes the first Black Justice of the Supreme Court. October 1, 1991, Thurgood retires after 24 years of service on the court. January 24, 1993. Thurgood dies of heart failure in Bethesda, Maryland at age 84. Major Court Cases Thurgood's work had a huge impact on the United States law. 
As an attorney, he argued more cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court than any other lawyer before him. As Solicitor General and then Associate Justice, he participated in landmark rulings too. These are a few of the many important cases he participated in. Murray v. Pearson, 1935 in Thurgood's first big case as an attorney, he represented Donald Murray, a young black man who wanted to attend the University of Maryland Law School. At the time, the school did not admit black students. On June 21, 1935, a judge ruled that the school's policy was not equal. Thurgood won the case again in the Maryland Court of Appeals on January 15, 1936, which resulted in the first court order to desegregate a school in the United States. Chambers v. The State of Florida, 1940 This was the first case Thurgood argued before the Supreme Court. In 1933, four young black men were accused of murder in Florida. They were arrested, held in jail for a week, aggressively questioned, and denied access to attorneys. The men at first insisted they were innocent, but after many days of this cruel treatment, they confessed and were convicted. Thurgood helped appeal their case to the higher courts. On February 12, 1940, the U.S. Supreme Court found that the men's confessions had been forced by police and should not count. The majority ruling determined that the police officers, lawyers, and judges must use due process of law, which means they must treat people fairly and follow the rules when they suspect someone has committed a crime. Sweet v. Painter, 1950 Thurgood represented Herman Marion Sweet, who, was, who wanted to attend an all-white university of Texas law school. The school had attempted to create a separate program for black students, but Thurgood and the NAACP argued that such segregation would not offer a truly equal education. Thurgood earned a unanimous decision in his favor from the U.S. Supreme Court on June 5, 1950. This case was one of several that paved the way for school integration to take effect nationwide. <coughs> Brown v. The Board of Education of Topeka, 1954 Oliver Brown, on behalf of his daughter Linda, joined with other black families in Topeka, Kansas, to sue the Board of Education. Thurgood argued the case before the U.S. Supreme Court twice, once in December of 1952 and again in December of 1953. On May 17, 1954, a unanimous Supreme Court ruling declared school segregation unconstitutional because separate education facilities were inherently unequal. Browder v. Gale, 1956 Thurgood and other NAACP attorneys represented Aurelia Browder and several other women who had experienced discrimination on the Montgomery, Alabama bus system. The group sued W.A. Gale, the mayor of Montgomery, in federal court. On June 5, 1956, three judges on the U.S. District Court ruled 2-1 to one that segregated buses were unconstitutional because the 14th Amendment gives all citizens the equal the right to equal treatment under the law. The U.S. Supreme Court affirmed the decision on November 13, 1956. The Montgomery bus system was integrated on December 20, 1956. Miranda v. The State of Arizona, 1966 Ernesto Miranda was arrested, charged with a crime, and questioned by police. He answered questions and signed a confession because he did not know he had the right to stay quiet or ask for an attorney to help him. No one told him. Miranda's attorney argued that the confession should not count because Miranda had not understood that the questions he answered for the police could be used against him in court. The Miranda case came to Thurgood while he was a solicitor general. He argued the case for the government because the Supreme Court, before the Supreme Court, and lost. On June 13, 1966, the justices ruled 5-4 to four in favor of Miranda. Because of this ruling, police officers must now inform people of their right to remain silent and their right to an attorney when they are being arrested or questioned. As Associate Justice, Thurgood heard and ruled, or dissented, in many influential cases too. He was on the bench when the judges ruled in. Roe v. Wade, 1973, 
which determined the state laws restricting access to abortion violated the right to privacy between doctor and patient. United States v. Nixon, 1974, which determined that the President of the United States is not above the law, cannot withhold evidence, and remains subject to criminal prosecution. Regents of the University of California v. Bach, 1978, which upheld affirmative action as a legal means for schools to promote diversity.